Black hole radiation has shown us that gravitational collapse is not as final as we once thought. If an astronaut falls into a black hole, he will be returned to the rest of the universe in the form of radiation. Thus, in a sense, the astronaut will be recycled. However, it would be a poor sort of immortality because any personal concept of time would come to an end as he is torn apart inside the black hole. All that would survive would be his mass or energy. One year, the Hawkins took me along when we went to a cottage in, in Wales near the River Wye. And this cottage was up a hill and there, there was a bit of a, a paved little sidewalk that, that went up to the cottage, which I had not been up. And, and of, of course, I wanted to do it in the least number of trips that I could imagine. So we put Stephen's batteries under his chair. I mean, his wheelchair has space for batteries and put extra batteries under there, which we, Stephen didn't realize he had that I'd put under there. So he didn't realize this wheelchair was as heavily laden as possible. So Stephen got quite a bit ahead of me and then he was turning the corner to go into around to his house, but that was on a slope. And, and so I looked up and I noticed Stephen's wheelchair was slowly tipping backward. And of course I was about <laughs> 10 meters away. <laughs> Tried to run up there, but he, I was not able to get there nearly rapidly enough before he toppled over backward into the bushes. And so it was a bit of a bit of a shocking sight to see this master of gravity getting overcome by the weak gravitational force of Earth. One of the worst things for me would be having people there all the time. I never alone, I and mean, I couldn't bear that. And uh, yet he finds things funny, and he enjoys life, and he goes dashing about all over the place. And I think this is tremendous, and, uh, but it's a sort of courage that I haven't got, and his father hadn't got it, uh, and we cannot but admire it, but wonder how on earth he got it, <laughs> really. There must have been 50 people there, and uh, I was standing off in a corner, sort of uh, uh, watching uh, quietly for a few minutes, relaxing, and uh, Stephen was over there not far from me. Jane walked over to Stephen and looked at him, and he was sitting there with his head in his lap, like only Stephen can put his head in his lap. And uh, Jane uh, said to Stephen, you look miserable, Stephen. Sit up straight. Some of your guests don't understand that you're sitting there thinking about physics and having a wonderful time. It looks like you're in pain. Sit up straight and go talk to your guests. In 1979, I was selected location professor of mathematics. This is the same chair, once held by Isaac Newton. They have a big book, which every university teaching officer is supposed to sign. After I had been location professor for about a year, they realized I had never signed. So they brought the book to my office, and I signed with some difficulty. That was the last time I signed my name. My interest in the origin and fate of the universe was reawakened when I attended a conference on cosmology in the Vatican. Afterwards, we were granted an audience with the Pope he told us that it was all right to study the evolution of the universe after the Big Bang. But we should not inquire into the Big Bang itself, because that was the moment of creation, and therefore, the work of God. I was glad that he did not know the subject of the talk I had just given. The possibility that the universe had no beginning, no moment of creation. There were theories in the early 70s, in fact the first type of creation theories, where the, the people concerned started off with a fixed external space and time, which, as it were, for eternity was empty. And then suddenly, for some unknown reason, the universe nucleates at a particular point, and then bang, it blows apart. But the trouble is that when space and time appear 
in the classical theory, that actual point itself is a singular point in the mathematics. The mathematics breaks down, and so you cannot in fact use that to give you a creation theory. If one goes back in time, one comes to the Big Bang singularity, where the laws of physics break down. But there's another direction of time that one can go in, which avoids the singularity. This is called the imaginary direction of time. In imaginary time, there need not be any singularities which form a beginning or end to time. When you come to imaginary time, you have this rather peculiar possibility of having a now, as it were, without necessarily having a, a sort of a chain of, 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 of past moments. Um, if uh, we start way out at the moment, start running backwards in time, as it were, then for a long time things work perfectly normally. But then as you begin to get further and further back towards what would be the origin point in the conventional real-time picture, you find that the nature of time changes, that the imaginary component becomes more and more prominent. And in the end, what ought to have been the singular point in the classical theory just gets smoothed away. And you have this sort of beautiful picture of these sort of bowls, uh, the, the creation of the universe's pictures as uh, where we are now, in a smooth sort of bowl of the past. Well, there's no initial point, just a sort of smooth shape. So long as the universe had a beginning, we could suppose it had a creator. But if the universe is completely self-contained, having no boundary or edge, it would neither be created nor destroyed. It would simply be. What place, then, for a creator? What we could really say is that the universe is, because it's a self-consistent mathematical structure. There's no past, because unlike the creations of point scenario, there's nothing for it to be created in, you see. So to say it's created from nothing is actually a little bit of a misnomer. It's, it's, mis it's a misleading use of the word nothing. It's not just that there was empty space in which the universe appeared, which you might call nothing. There was really nothing at all, because there wasn't even a creation event. You see, the, the, the use of a past tense in a verb becomes inappropriate in these theories. Unfortunately, tenses were set up when people believed in real time, of course. <laughs> and we don't yet have a linguistic uh, form to describe tenses in imaginary time. The word time was not handed down from heaven as a gift from on high. The idea of time is a word invented by man. And if it has puzzlements connected with it, whose fault is it? It's our fault. Where does the difference between the past and the future come from? The laws of science do not distinguish between the past and the future. Yet, there is a big difference between the past and future in ordinary life. You may see a cup of tea fall off a table and break into pieces on the floor, but you will never see the cup gather itself back together and jump back on the table. The increase of disorder, or entropy, is what distinguishes the past from the future, giving a direction to time. He fell ill in Switzerland. When he came back, he was on a ventilator. Because he's on a ventilator, you've got a tube down your throat and therefore you can't speak, just for that reason. For that period, which may have been a couple of months, I spent probably one in two nights, one in three nights, at the hospital. Because when he was in hospital, um, he couldn't communicate with the nurses. I mean, it's not just like being seriously ill but you're in a position where the nurses couldn't understand what Stephen wanted. If Stephen was uncomfortable, they couldn't tell why. 